I, I need you to put on your big boy pants this morning, okay? Hey, you let your big boy pants on for we, we, we've, got a, we've got a meaty piece we're going to work through. And um, again, I just want to highlight, why do we read so much Bible in the church? When you don't do it in the see? And so, <laughs> so, so if you give me one opportunity, I'm going to use it, okay? And we spend a lot of time to make sure that you can follow on the board. So I'm, I'm, I'm going to need you to be a bit patient. We've got, we've got a big section that we want to work through. But do not underestimate the influence of the word. I'm going to ask you to open your heart. We're going to share a couple of things. And then we're going to try to beat the Methodist to the McDonald's drive through um, at the end. I'm going to read out of a passage out of 2 Kings chapter 4. Um, phenomenal piece. This is where Elisha comes on the scene. If you're not so much familiar with this, um, just before him was a big guy named Elijah. And he's considered a phenomenal prophet to the people of Israel. And Elisha is his successor. And the whole book of Kings is this idea of tracing how God managed the kings and the prophets and how he involved them to make a difference. This is the mindset of the author of this. It's basically the history of the kings and the prophets of the nation of Israel during this time, way, way before Jesus. We're going to jump straight in to Kings 4 verse 8. My theme is... Um, out of proportion, and we're going to talk about that in a second, but I want to just get through um, this piece of text. One day, Elisha went to Shunem. I'm, I'm probably pronouncing that wrong, but for practical purposes, and where a wealthy woman lived who urged him to eat some food. So um, whenever he passed that way, he would turn in there to eat food. And she said to her husband, Behold now, I know that this is a holy man of God who is continually passing our way. Let us make a small room on the roof with walls and put there for him a bed, a table, a chair, and a lamp, so that whenever he comes to us, he can go in there. Verse 11. And one day he came there, and he turned into the chamber and rested there. And he said to Gehazi, Yeah. His servant called to the Shunammite. When he had called her, she stood before him and he said to him, I mean, and he said to him, Say now to her, See, you have taken all this trouble for us. That is what is to be done for you. Would you have a word spoken on your behalf to the king or to the commander of the army? And she answered, I dwell among my own people. So confident, so, so strong. A, a very phenomenal lady, actually. Any case, verse 14. And he said, what then is to be done for her? And Gehazi answered, well, she has no son and her husband is old. And he said, call her. And when he had called her, she stood in the doorway and said, at this season, um, at this season about the time next year, you shall embrace a son. And she said, listen, no, my Lord, O man of God, do not lie to your servant. But the woman conceived, and she bore a son about the time the following spring, as Elisha had said to her. And now there's a small little twist in the story, um, and we're going to carry on. When the child had grown, he went out one day to his father among the reapers. And he said to his father, Oh, my head, my head. The father said um, to his servant, Carry him to his mother. Amper typische man ding wat daar sal nou gebeur, nee. <laughs> and when he had lifted him and brought him to his mother, the child sat on her lap till noon, and then he died. And she went up and laid him on the bed of the man of God and shut the door behind him and went out. And then she called to her husband and said, Send me one of the servants and one of the donkeys that I may quickly go to the man of God and come back again. Verse 23, and he said, Why will you go to him today? It is neither new moon nor Sabbath. She said, All is well. All is well. Alice is fine. Never trust a woman when she says all is fine. It's not fine. And then she settled. It's funny how we can read an ancient text, but still so relevant to our lives today. 
And then she saddled the donkey and she said to the servant, urge the animal on, do not slacken the pace for me unless I tell you. So um, she set out and came to the man of God at Mount Carmel. All right, we're almost done, just the last section. And when the man of God saw her coming, he said to Gehazi, his servant, look, there is the Shunammite, run at once to meet her and say to her, is all well with you? Is all well with your husband? Is all well with your child? And she answered, all is well, Alice is fine. Verse 27, and when she came to the mountain, the man of God, she caught hold of his feet, and Gehazi came to push her away, but the man of God said, leave her alone, for she is in bitter distress, distress. and the Lord has, listen, and the Lord has hidden it from me and has not told me. Weird. 28, then she said, did I ask my Lord for a son? Did I not say, do not deceive me? Verse 29, he said to Gehazi, tie up your garment and take my staff in your hand and go. If you meet anyone, do not greet him. And if anyone greets you, do not reply and lay my staff on the face of the child. Verse 30, just the last couple of verses. Then the mother of the child said, as the Lord lives and as you yourself live, I will not leave you. So he arose and followed her. Verse 31, Gehazi went on ahead and laid the staff on the face of the child, but there was no sound or sign of life. Therefore, he returned to meet him and told him, the child has not awakened. 32, when Elisha came into the house, he saw the child lying dead on his bed. Verse 33, so he went in and shut the door behind the two of them and prayed to the Lord. Then he went up and lay on the child, putting his mouth on his mouth, his eyes on his eyes, and his hands on his hands. And he stretched himself upon him. The flesh of the child became warm. Almost done. Then he got up again, walked once back um, and forth in the house, and went up and stretched him upon, um, himself upon him. The child sneezed seven times, and the child opened his eyes. Massive piece. I know it's big. I tried to cut it down. I can't cut it down. We have to talk about that entire section in order to understand what's happening. Mind-blowing things that has been said. Let's pray, and then we're going to start preaching. Father, I stand before you humbly, and I request one more time that you would shower your grace upon me, Father. May you touch my lips. May you touch my mind that I can be an effective vessel, Father. Not for the honor of the vessel, but for honor for the God who this vessel represents this morning, Father. We have not come up out of loyalty to a building, a constitution, a structure, Father. We have come up out of loyalty to you, Father. And may this gathering this morning please you. We honor you and we choose you, Yahweh, as the God who we want to serve. We pray that in Jesus' wonderful name and everyone says, Amen. Now, I want to jump to, um, you guys know usually how I, how I minister. We read the section. I'm going to build up, and then we're going to go back again to the section. I'm going to break it down for you. In this week, I had a, this, this, this peculiar, pe peculiar incident. Um, I've got this thing about white socks, okay? Um, and no, it's not because I like Michael Jackson, but it's got, the white, it's got a white sock thing, okay? And um, we, we are a household of five people. And so what we try and do, we raise our kids being involved in cleaning and all those things in chores. And no, they don't get paid for that. They're part of the house. And so they need to function together. And um, uh, Andre and myself, we would be actively involved and they would assist us. So washing is done. The thing is hanging outside. And now we get our children to gather the washing and put it away in our cupboards. Okay, it's, it's basic stuff. Until one morning when I took out my pair of white socks. And when I pulled it up, I noticed the one sock ends here, and the other one ends up here. Something's odd. It's out of proportion. So I just thought, no, that's just something that happened, okay? And just to give you an idea, I put on my socks in the, in the living room area. Okay, our living room is our bedroom, our kitchen, and our, it's everything in one place. But my kids are there, and I'm putting on my socks. And then they packed it away. So maybe they made a mistake. So I send them to go get another pair quickly, and they bring another pair, and I put it on, and it's the exactly same thing happened. So now I thought, okay, this is probably the other pair that's mixed up. But by the third pair of socks, I noticed something is off. And you guys, you guys wanna you guys wanna pick up on, on what happened? While I'm stressing to put on the socks and getting done with work, I have a small boy, AJ, standing in the corner who doesn't have front teeth, 
and smiling. I'm frustrated and he's smiling. I ask him, who come smile ye? And you know what he said? I pranked you. <laughs> my little dude messed up all my socks on purpose. And he waited four days in order to get the prank out of me. He didn't say a word. And he was just smiling over there. And I was so frustrated. But it, it was it was a heck of a hell funny. A heck of a heaven funny. It was just it was it was phenomenal um, for them. And so it's it's just part of, of being a dad. And and what was interesting about this idea of out of proportion, if, if that's not enough, I, I'm just sharing with you, and this is gonna sound very funny. This is how I actually came up with my theme, because the term out of proportion popped up as I was busy um, doing my normal Bible study as well. And so I knew I had to speak about the topic out of proportion. My socks was messed up. And when you read about this in your theology books, you know you have to talk about that this morning. Um, it's, it's in the book, and um, I referred to it previously as well. N.T. Wright, he's, he's a co-author in this book. And he writes about this history of Israel. And there's something phenomenal that he says that I want to show you. And he says this, uh, there's this picture of Israel and he says this, the land of Israel is a small country. I want you to pick up the words are highlighted for a specific reason. You can walk its length north to south, south in a few days and from its central mountains you can see the lateral boundaries, the sea to the west and the river to the east. So what he's saying is if you stand high enough you can see everything. It's, it's not so far that you can't reach um, your, your the, this um the line of sight is not so far that you can't see. You can see everything. Carry on for me, please. And then he carries on and says, but pick up on this. But it has had an importance out of all proportion to its size. In other words, it's a small town, a small nation. It's tiny, but its significance has been out of proportion to its size. Empires have fought over this. Look at what he says next. He says, listen to this. Every 44 years out of the last 4,000, on average, an army has marched through it. Whether to conquer it, to rescue it from someone else, you can carry on for me, to use it as a neutral battleground on which to fight a different enemy, or to take advantage of it as the natural route for getting somewhere else to fight there instead. In other words... For a small nation, there's a heck of a lot of conflict. For a small area, the conflict, the battles, the fighting is out of pur proportion to the size of the nation. I mean, there's more. It feels to me like just in our time, there's more politics surrounding the small nation of Israel than a big nation like America, for example. There's more wars and turmoil in the small nation of Israel in comparison to bigger nations just around its area as well. So something is going on because the conflict, the battle is out of proportion proportion to its size and then N.T. Wright writes this in the most beautiful poetic way and he says there are many places which once beautiful are now battered and mangled with the legacies of war and he's talking about Israel and yet it has remained a beautiful land still producing grapes figs and yet it becomes very cheesy out of the bible and with milk and honey to this day Every 44 years, on average, there has been an army going through, it's war-ridden, the politics is out of proportion, a lot of fighting, but yet we find Israel today still being a nation, the nation of milk and honey, in comparison to the situation. Out of proportion. The challenges of Israel is out of proportion to its size. And I want you to hold on to that idea that we're going to speak about. Now I'm going to jump again. Um, you can put up the next slide for me. There's a place that was recently discovered, and it's called Gobekli Go Go Tepe. Okay, it, it, it's, it's a term that means like pot belly. Like when I lie on my back on a Sunday morning, okay, and my kids wake up and they see my stomach, like you see my stomach going slight. That's, that's the term, okay, that's what it means. This is a slight pot belly lying on, on the zeal. And what's interesting about that, you can stay here, um, they found this large circular structures in the southern east, southeast, 
Southeastern Anatolia region in Turkey. Now, why this terminology is important is because I want you to pick up on this. This is the area that they refer to as the first fertile crescent. In other words, the idea of terminologies like Mesopotamia and Egypt and Nile and civilizations and, and people building structures, it, it comes from this one place because it was very fruitful in this area. So immediately, the archaeologists are looking in this area because it seems like this is where culture started. This is where the idea of civilization started. This is the idea of where this agriculture idea started. We walk around, we see a cow, we see fantastic. Those things did not exist back then. There wasn't domesticated animals. A winky, there wasn't something like this. There was wild animals, okay? Um, and especially during this time in this area, they noticed these structures, okay? Now, as archaeologists do, they do these carbon dating type of things, and I want you to pick up on the next slide quickly. As they've been doing this dating thing, they noticed that it contains big stone pillars that some call, listen to this, the world's oldest megaliths. In other words, what they are saying is, it's the oldest, biggest stone structures that is known to man at this time. Okay, now just to give you an idea, these structures, some of these pillars is about almost 6 meters high, 5.5 meters high. That's very high. Now, to us, it's like, yeah, it's a big stone. No, no, pick up on this, how old this is, okay? So according to carbon dating, it's been dated to a pre-pottery Neolithic period, which is about 12,000 years ago. In other words, 10,000 um, 10, BC. Now, before you get angry, what about Genesis? I cannot go into detail about that. We would, I would love to talk about that, but I can't, I can't. This is not discrediting the Bible on any level, okay? So just want to mention this. But what I want you to highlight on, it's old, it's really old, and it's really big. And what makes this so phenomenal to the archaeologist that's been discovering this place, Gobekli Tepe, is this. I mean, pottery didn't even exist then. That's why they call it the pre-pottery era. Pottery, the idea, the technology of pottery. Yeah, the, the technology of pottery in part of culture didn't exist back then, okay? But... It falls in a time when people were hunter-gatherers. Now, why this is significant is people were traveling around. We were eating from bushes over here. We were buying steaks over there, hunting all the big animals. So the idea of having this massive settlement with these big stone structures is odd for its time. So what the archaeologist outside the Bible is saying, it seems like this is the oldest proof where people are drawing together with this idea of having settlements and staying together and building for permanent residence. Okay? Now, there's a lot of theories with regards to this. I don't have time to go into that. That's not the point of this discussion, but you can go check this out. Um, you can go check. I mean, Wikipedia, TEDx has been talking about this. This is on National Geographic, so it's, it's quite popular. You can just go check it out, and you can see a lot of the information. Now, why this is under the attention of the world is it seems like this is proof of the oldest temple because of the structure. So they, 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 they are careful to call it temple because it's way back. When we think of temple, we think about church and gathering, but it was something a little bit different for them in their time because the culture was a little bit different. Now, um, Dr. Michael Aiza has, has picked up on this, and there's a couple of interesting things that he points out. These big Pillars that you see, these T pillars that has been that has been um, shown in the in the pictures when you go look this out, it's in the shape of men. So it's a T pillar, but these 5.5 meter pillars, they've got hands and they've got a belt carrying on. And the question is, where does this idea come from so many years ago about these big people and these big icons in a temple format? Now immediately, and I know this is going to go a little bit deep, and I don't have time to talk about that. When you read about um, the, big, the book of Enoch, if you're familiar with Dr. Michael Eisen's theories, if you talk about the Nephilim and the giants and all these things, there's, there's these phenomenal hints popping up with regards to that. But the biggest change, according to Michael Eisen, is the immediate culture, culture shift that's taking place. So according to him, something drastic happened where people change their culture out of the blue. Hunter-gatherers to settlers. People who were foraging to the start of the agrarian culture, the start of when we started with farming. What we do today, this is the birth of this. What makes this phenomenal, it's extremely old. And archaeologists are baffled by this. 
And uh, we can argue about those things, and there's a lot of stuff that I want to talk about there, but for time's sake, just to pick, I just want you to pick up on this. I, I do believe that we live in an arrogant culture today, an arrogant culture today, because we think we are smarter than other people because we can see further into space. We think we are smarter than other, other time periods because we've got calculators or we've got computers. Now, we have technology, but I think it's arrogance to look back at society and our culture and say, people were stupid and now we are smart. Funny how we're struggling to argue about things. We can't, we can't explain everything with our computers and it, it's, it's still a development in process. Now, I'm not yet to argue about philosophy. What I'm trying to say is that we, have a, we live in an arrogant culture. When we look back at people, we think stupid, smart. They didn't know what germs are. Look how phenomenal. We don't know what germs are. We just buy Dettol and hope it fixes something, man. We just, we just follow what the smart people are telling us. And the point being is that sometimes this idea of people being stupid is nonsense because Gobekli Tepe is showing us that even further back, people had the ability to work with stone. Their technology was limited, not their capabilities. The technology was not as advanced as we are, but they weren't stupid. They were intelligent. They could map the stars. They measured these things. And we asked, oh, but how do they do this with these complicated calculations? I mean, um, 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 Michael Azer just explains it simply. He says, you put a stick in the ground, and then you measure it. And as the sun is moving, you begin to pick up patterns in this big round circle. And if you do this long enough, you pick up seasons, you pick up time. You don't need a calculator. You need a stick and you need a lot of time. And this is what was happened. These people were so intelligent that they could develop the ideas of science that we have today. Okay, The ideas of time, the ideas of seasons, the idea of maths. Now, this is very, very far back. The point being is people were gathering together much further back. 10,000 years before Jesus put foot on this earth, there were people building towns, building nations with beautiful precision. And it's pieces of art that exist up until this day. Man, our salary can't even last a month, but these people's workmanship lasted, lasted thousands and, and thousands of years. People weren't stupid. Technology was limited. And I want to argue today that sometimes we read the Bible the same way archaeologists looks at the world. Sometimes we read the Bible and we forget that the people who were writing these stories, they were connected to the experience. But for some reason, we glance over the text like a fairy tale story. For some reason, we just glance over these things and we don't put emotion to this and we miss the spiritual message because we are smart and they are stupid. We have ability and Elisha was just someone in a book. No, no. If, and I, I want to I I demonstrate this to you. All I'm going to do today, I'm going to put the emotion part into the story, and then I'm going to show you what pops up when we realize and read the Bible as if Elisha was really real, okay? And the reason why I'm speaking this way is not because I don't believe, it's because people don't believe anymore, because it's a fantasy story. It's, it's classified under mythology, but this morning, we're going to go through this. I want you to hang on to this idea. We're going to speak about out of proportion. People aren't stupid. The Old Testament aren't irrelevant. There's a lot of depth in this story, and we're going to put emotion into the story. We're going to read this with emotion that we feel today, and then we're going to see what pops up within the story. Is that fine with you guys? <sighs> okay, come on, begin. One day, Elisha went on to Shunem. You know, you guys know the story because we just read it, but I want to highlight a couple of things. Where a wealthy woman lived. A wealthy woman. Now, the first thing that's phenomenal about this is that the Bible is speaking about women. This is, this is, this is phenomenal, okay? I want you to pick up on this. A unknown lady, we don't know her name, but a story makes it into the Bible. In a time where women did not have any rights. And by the way, the Bible highlights something more phenomenal about this. This was a wealthy lady. 
This was a lady who wasn't suppressed by society and wasn't suppressed by culture. And she didn't take no for answer. This is just my assumption because being a woman is already being an underdog in the Bible and in the story. But being a wealthy woman is putting emphasis on the ability of a lady to surpass the pressures of culture and still be successful. This is not a small matter that we are reading here. This is a big matter. All right. We live in a time when, when I mean, women are still fighting for their, for their rights. They are still battling for equality in the marketplace, even to this time. And we're living in a time where there was no such thing at all. And the Bible picks up on, but hang on, there was a wealthy woman who lived here. All right. Next one. And in the story, she is so successful and wealthy that her husband listens to her, okay? That's a smart husband, okay? When your wealthy wife comes to you and tells you, we are going to build a room, you are going to build a room, okay? If, a well, if your wealthy wife comes to you and she says, we're going to move, we are going to move. And the Bible doesn't say it so explicitly, but they saying that, the lady it for a man gesê, and he listened. Okay, fantastic. You woman, you must highlight these things so you can give it to your husbands, okay? And they, they want to build this place, and they do build this place for Elisha, this phenomenal prophet. And this is what's interesting. Elisha feels compelled to say, But you have been so gracious to me, what can I do for you? And he comes to the point where he says, Can Elisha, this is phenomenal, can I speak to the king on your behalf? Now just hold up here. Elisha was such a phenomenal prophet that he had access to the king. You try to pick up your phone and phone Mr. Ramaphosa quickly. Go send the mail. Go stand at home of his line. You can do whatever you want to. Tag him on Twitter. I don't care what you do. You go and try and get Mr. Ramaphosa's attention. So this is not small. This is significant that we are picking up. And he says, man, you were so nice. If I can't do something for the king, can I speak to the commander of his army? In other words, Elisha says, you have been so good to me that I want to do something back. And this is the authority that I have. This is the, the area of influence. This is mind-blowing, the type of connection he had. And her answer is this. She answered, I dwell among my own people. I don't need to see the president. I am fine. I don't need the army. I, I don't need you, prophet, manly masculinity to help me. I'm helping you. Okay. I don't need your help. I dwell among my own people. I conquer among my own people. I'm strong among my own people. I am being a blessing to you, not because I'm desiring something back. I am in the position to be the blessing. But thank you. I appreciate that. She walks away and, 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 and Elisha is, is baffled because he needs to, he's not going to allow a woman to talk like to him that way. And he asks his servant, but you can carry on to the next one. Is there nothing? Is there nothing? And something sneaky pops up in this message. Well, she has no son. And immediately the story becomes extremely serious just in this sentence. Barrenness is no joke, even in today's time. For a mommy or a wife not to be able to bear children is a thing with technology today. Can you imagine with women not having a lot of value, women being stigmatized, and the story of Eiffa running around in the newspapers, and then they come to the point where you can't have children. It, it's so, the, the, the ancient text goes so far to say that people were, were cursed. You weren't seen by God. You were rejected by God. You are bringing dishonor to your house. And immediately I pick up on something that just because you're successful in one area, it doesn't mean you're successful in another area. And it's quite possible that because of the lack of being a mommy, the only thing this lady had left was to prove herself to society because she can't have children and she overcompensates and this, this is just my interpretation this is just the way I read this I'm not saying this is accurate but I can't help seeing this when I read this she is unsuccessful as a mother but she's going to throw her time into being a successful wealthy businesswoman. 
And what looks successful to us from the outside is actually a screaming out of pain. Because there's an imbalance in our life. How many times do we look at other people and we say, I want to be like that. I want to be successful like that. I want to be popular like that. Yes, that's the, that's the one part. But many times there's an imbalance and people overcompensate. Because they're hurting in this area, they're going to fight to be successful. in. Because they've been bullied, they're going to go to the gym and be strong. Because they are hurting, they're going to make sure that they are successful in some area. To show that they are something. To show that they are someone. And this lady is accused of being barren because she doesn't have a son. Next. He comes and he's, Elisha calls and he says, this time next year you will have a son. And she gets a little bit sensitive. And she says, this is not something you play with. Speaking to the prophet. He said, do not lie to me. I'm not saying that she accused him of making a joke, but just to illustrate this, there's many things that you can joke about. There's many things you can talk about. But this is a sensitive topic. So when you speak this, I want you to look me in the eye and I want you to take serious for one moment because you are playing with a hurt on the inside of my heart. Do not lie to me about this. And something beautiful happened. She gave birth and everything happened beautifully. I want you to pick up on something. She did not ask for this. She did not ask for a son. She didn't ask for favors. This is a gift that has been given her. She didn't go knocking for trouble. She didn't go ask for difficulty. She was helping the prophet and problems came knocking on her front door. She got a son and I want you to pick up on this. It's not getting a son and dying. It's not getting a son and something bad happened. You lost your only son. Because this part says, and he, he was running back, the, the servant brought him back, and he, the, the boy, after he was been growing up, sitting on his mother's lap. And I want you to think about this. When you have a child that's sick in hospital, a lot of things run through your mind. You have no power. You are successful, but you have no power. You have authority over staff. You have no authority over disease. And you sit hopelessly. And all this mommy can do is hold on to the one thing that she can't give herself. And the son dies in her arm. And we read this. Ladies and gentlemen, when your only child dies in your arms, something happens on the inside. And the, 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 the story carries on and it becomes more intense because she, she picks up her only, her dead son, the dead body, holding it in her hands and she goes back to the source of where this promise came from and she puts him down on the bed of this, this, this man of God. But some might think it's a move of faith. Uh, don't miss this. It's not faith. It's desperation. There's no other option. There's no doctors she can pay. There's no medication. There's no information. There's a dead son and there's a source where it comes from. That's the only place I can run back to. And this whole story goes how she lays her son down. And now she needs to travel to the man of God. But this is the interesting part. Mount Carmel, if you look at the geography from where they were, it's about, I think it's 20 miles. So that's about 35, 40 kilometers. So it takes a time. Listen to this. For a mommy, and this, is, this is, just shows the desperation for me. For a mom to leave the body of a dead child, to close the door, and travel 40 kilometers to go look for an answer. Moms don't do that. My mom doesn't do that. Okay? Okay, she can't travel that far. If I know my mom, man, I can be dead outside in the street. She will not leave me. She will wait there even if there's no life. There's no way 
She will leave me behind even if I'm not even there. There's no, for a mom to close the door, the son she loves, to turn her back on that, that's complete desperation. She doesn't send the servant. She goes herself. Can you imagine that journey for 40 kilometers? Knowing your son is dead and not knowing what answer you can get on the other side. The story gets actually worse because as she gets to Elisha, he has no idea what's going on. And he says that, he says, God has been hiding this from me. So get this, the guy who's got the answer, the guy who is the source has no answer. He wasn't even aware. There's no hope. And look at what she tells him. She says, she doesn't ask him or say anything. She opens this way. Listen to this. This is her first words. Did I not ask my Lord for a son? And did I not say, do not deceive me? Do not play with this in my life. This is not a joke. This is not something simple. This is a son that I could not have. This is hurt. This is pain. This is 40 kilometers. Listen, listen. She sat by her son. He passed away in her arms. She traveled 40 kilometers just to look the prophet in the eye and said, I told you. I told you. I didn't ask for things. You wanted to do me. I, did, I do not want this. I do not want the pain. I do not want the earth. And Elisha, the prophet and man of God, is caught off guard. He has no idea. And I get a sense of panic because immediately, what, and look at this part. He, he told his servant, he says, tie up your garment and take my staff. I'm going to talk about that in a second in your hand and go. If you meet anyone, do not greet them. This is so urgent. You don't stop to say hello. You don't stop to speak. You don't, you don't stop for nothing. You take my staff and you rush to the other side. You rush and hurry and put the staff on his head. Now, this is phenomenal. Elisha had no idea of what's happening. And out of shock, the first response he does is just, just take this thing and put it down. And what this thing was, was it represented power. If you, if, you, if you look at the idea of staff, especially in this cultural time, it was something very special. Moses had a staff as well. Aaron had a staff. If, if there's these hints in the Bible that the staff represented power. It represented authority. And Elisha's answer is, do this. This is me giving you help. Put this down. Look what happened. And Gehazi went on ahead and laid the staff on the face of the, on the, face of the child. And it did not work. Don't forget this. The attention is Elisha coming to the foreground. But while we're speaking about Elisha, there's a mom behind the scenes. And the answer that the prophet gives her is not working. And they are following exactly the prophet's words. The staff that can heal people. The staff that represents the, the power of Yahweh, the authority of Yahweh. And they get so attached to the staff thing, it doesn't work. Can you imagine the servant coming back, a mommy on her way. She's looking for help on her way back. And as she's rushing back, the, the servant of Elijah went there and he's coming back to meet her. And she doesn't know what the news is yet. We know the news. She doesn't know the news. She sees this servant running towards her and she doesn't know. Is it good news? Is it bad news? There's confusion. There's emotion. There's hurt. There's insecurities. There's all these bad things happening. And the servant pops up and says, it's not working. The word of the prophet is not working. And you can see the anxiousness of this mommy to get back to her child, even though her child is dead. Story gets worse. Elisha comes into the house. And don't just read this. I want you to feel this. And the bed where he laid, Elisha, the bed where he got visions, the bed where God spoke to him. 
the bed where God was, was, was putting ideas and thoughts and, and um, prophetic words in his heart. And he walks in and what used to be a bed of inspiration, he walks in and a dead boy is lying on the bed. And I don't care what time you live in, what culture, what religion, this moves you. A dead boy lying. A dead promise. By his word. And in the past, the staff thing worked. But it's not working anymore. And the prophet begins to panic. Hold up. The man of God begins to become concerned about the process. A mommy is in the background. And there's no answer from Yahweh in this situation. Now look at what Elisha does. So he went in and he shut the door behind them. The two of them prayed to the Lord. And nothing happened. Two. The man of God behind a closed door. And this is not a two of them become so intense in prayer and they don't stop because every time I want you to picture this. Elijah and his servant, they're walking up and down in this room. And they're praying, and they're praying, and they're calling out to God. And when they turn around, they look, they see there's a dead boy still lying. And they keep on praying, keep on praying, walking up and down, and they look. And there's still a dead boy lying, and it's, it's confusion. It's, don't think there, there is, there's faith. Don't think there is, there's this surety. There's unsurety. There's concern, there's desperation. And while he's walking up and down, don't forget a mommy on the outside waiting. Don't forget a family on the outside. I mean, I'm sure that Elijah, Elisha, as he was walking, he could hear a cry out on the outside because there's complete chaos in this house. And he sent a stage and responsible. And they prayed. And God does not answer the prayer. And the Bible carries on and says, and he begins to walk up and down forth in the house. This is not a move of faith. This is not a move of comfortability. This is a move of desperation because he's pacing up and down in this house and nothing is happening. And he, and he becomes so desperate that he breaks the rules in this next part. Look at this, what he does now. He says, and he went up and he stretched himself upon him. He lies on the boy. I want you to pick up on this. This is not allowed. A prophet is not allowed to touch death. This is the rules. This is the contract he signed when God called him. He says, Lord, I will not follow and I will obey. And he breaks the rules out of the because his staff did not work. His prayer did not work. And now he's going to break the rules. And he lies over this child's body with this idea of giving everything that he's got out of desperation to make things work. And only then does the child sneeze a couple of times and he wakes up. We read the story so quickly, but I want you to pick up the moment we put emotion into the story when we feel what is going on in the book. We notice that God can bless us out of proportion to our faith. So many times we put our journeys in our hands. And here we've got a phenomenal prophet who was trained by Elijah. And he had no answers. And God showed up anyway. His prayers did not work. And God showed up eventually anyway. He broke the rules. And God showed up anyway. And it's this time when my, when my mind jumps to this idea of if you have faith like a small little mustard seed, the message that's going out in the story when we put that heartbeat in the story is that God can bless you even when you don't have enough faith. God can call you even when you don't believe in Him. My dad just shared the story with me in the week. While he was a police officer in a police station, he didn't go looking for God. God sent someone to come looking for him. Where, where was the faith? There was no faith. There was no belief. There was no hunger. There was a policeman 
attending, standing up, getting ready for duty, and God comes and He looks for him. Paul, where was Paul's faith? He was on his way to persecute, and guess what? Guess who showed up? God showed up then in spite of his faith. So many times, there's these stories over and over and over again in the Bible. They say, man, we don't know everything. We don't have all the answers. But if you think, if I say this prayer, I'm going to get this, you are missing God. Because God is God and he shows up how he chooses. God can heal a dead person with no faith. And God will turn his face away from his son dying on a cross just as much. And we sit and we argue and we say, you don't have enough faith. You didn't pay enough tithing. You don't believe. You don't read your Bible. And well, I'm here to tell you something. That God is much bigger than the regulations that we place on people. And God will come and fetch you whether you believe in Him or not. You choose if you want to respond to that. You choose. Because God shows up. And we put this faith, we put our faith, and we laugh at the story because it's a staff. Come on, we do this in the church. The staff is just replaced by a pastor in today's time. I'm going through a dip. I need the pastor to pray over my business. I need the pastor to pray over. We are not a lucky charm. We do not dictate what God does. I can request the same way you can request. I can pray the same way you pray. I can come to church the same way you can come to church. But the authority, the power, it lies with Yahweh and it's not in the hands of man. And this is why we need to be careful that we begin to become arrogant in our culture, especially inside the church. We become arrogant about our success. We begin to, we, we adjust storylines so that we can look successful like God is doing something. People lie about people getting healed to show that God does miracles. Man, we don't have to build a fake faith. We don't have to lie for God. We don't have to protect God. We don't have to defend anything. We just have to communicate. We just have to shine light. Maybe you're sitting here and you feel like you don't have enough faith. It's fine. It's fine. Paul didn't have any faith. <laughs> he persecuted the church. But God chose him in any case. You know those 12 disciples? They didn't have any faith. When the grave was there, they walked away. And here's the best part of it all. Even when they saw Jesus, they still didn't understand things afterwards. Still, there was a lack in their life. God chose them anyway. Out of this entire story, from this ancient civilization, speaking about things, running through this whole idea of this Old Testament story, be careful just to glance over something. The author is writing something spectacular, and I want you to pick up on this as well. Can you imagine the impact this story had to the time when it was written in? Remember, we have Baal, the fertile God that's making a name for himself. He's the God of fertility. He's the real God. And yes, somewhere along the side, somewhere quiet, a woman wasn't even asking for something. And God comes and does something so spectacular, not based on a ritual, not based on something special, because God just chose to show up. And this story spread so far and wide that it was written down and it made its way into our Bible today to recall something that happened. To show that Yahweh is God. Amen. And I've got news for you. You might not want God, but God is speaking to you this morning. You haven't really been looking for God, but you being here this morning, God is shouting at you and says he's looking for you. He's looking to you. He's calling out to you. And you can run away, and you can go and hide, and you can go back home, and you can ignore what's taking place, but God is not stopping knocking at your door. He's speaking. He's calling out. He says, you, I know you don't have enough faith. It's fine. I'm going to show up anyway. I know you don't know the scripture verse. It's fine. I'm going to show up anyway. I know you haven't been baptized. It's fine. It's fine. I'm going to show up any case, and I'm going to speak to you this morning, right here, right now, and I'm going to invite you and say, man, I'm inviting you one more time. I'm going to invite you one more time. You don't have to look the part. You don't have to sound the part. You don't even have to smell the part. The question is, are you going to respond? Because God's blessing can be out of proportion 
to your faith. Because you can have a small amount of faith and God can give a big amount of blessing. And don't think I'm talking about giving attendance to the church and getting a thousand. No, 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 no. What I'm saying is that, man, you might not even be, you can only be interested in God in this much. But is he going to show up this much in any case in your life? God's blessing is always out of proportion. The nation of Israel, the wars, the blessings, the success, the failure, it's out of proportion to its size. God's involvement in your life will always be out of proportion. Let's pray together. Father, your word always carries power and authority, Father. And this morning you've been speaking straight into my heart, Father. Into our heart, Father. Father, sometimes we we battle in our lives and we don't feel good enough for us in the church. We feel like rejected sons and daughters in your house, Father. Sometimes people outside the church feel like they're not good enough. But I know that your message is clear this morning. That you love us anyway. And your love for us is out of proportion to our works. Your love for us is out of proportion to our faith. Your love for us is out of proportion to who we are. But that is what makes you a good father. You love your children anyway. This morning, thank you for your word that carries power and authority, Father. And we admit that we all fall short. But we're going to show up next week anyway. I might forget about you this afternoon, Father, but I'm going to show up anyway, Father. I might might mess up in the week, but I'm going to show up anyway, Father. Not because I am good, Father, but I'm showing up with a humble heart because you are good, Father. Thank you for always showing up. We pray that in Jesus' wonderful name, everyone says, Amen.